how we think rightly about land and exile, exodus and conquest, landedness and pilgrimage uh, in our own historical redemptive context, in our ecclesial situatedness. What resources do these passages uh, of scripture, maybe we want to call them socio-political, maybe we don't. Um, what, what resources do these passages have, if any, uh, for preachers and teachers today as we uh, build up and equip the saints? So Mike, why don't I let you get the ball rolling by giving a, a brief synopsis of what you argue in that chapter, uh, and then we'll just let the conversation go. Well, I'll just throw out enough fodder for my betters to, uh, to correct. Uh, I'm eager uh, very much to hear what Dana and John have to say. Uh, first of all, I, I liked your opening because I do think that there is uh, a moment here where a lot of, a, a, a lot of evangelicals are uh, wondering where is the communal embodiment aspect of the Christian faith. Uh, Jesus in my heart, I get uh, conversion, I get what does this have to do with life in this world and concrete social practices. And so one group, uh, I'm being overly simplistic, but one group tends to say, well, it's not the visible church at all. It's the world. There's where we find our concrete communal embodiment and our concrete activity, uh, not in the ministry uh, of the word and the sacraments, uh, not in the communion of saints as much as through our own works in the world. And then another group said, no, 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 no. Uh, pox on both your houses, we're going to Rome uh, or Eastern Orthodoxy. We're going to find that concrete uh, ecclesial embodiment. And so I, one, I, I liked your way of framing that because I, I do think that we're at a moment where we, you see those two tendencies. And the first tendency is as evident on the left as it is the right. There are conservative and more liberal ways of cashing out the, what I would think, what I would call the leveling out of the testaments and the topography, the valleys and hills of redemptive history. Uh, what I mean by that is the tendency to still use the Bible as a collection of proof texts. And I'm sure you encountered that in Norway where uh, on one hand people criticize Christians uh, and Jews for their texts of terror. And on the other hand, there are sometimes people, um, uh, in, in, especially in North America, who seem to uh, bring life to that caricature because they, uh, they appeal to texts of holy war, for example, as if somehow it had any relationship at all to a modern democratic republic like the United States as if America had a covenant with God in some sense. And, and that's a danger, but the same thing can be done when we appeal to Amos uh, or Micah as if it just has a direct relationship to the New Covenant Church. And I think we miss the regime change that Jesus brings, especially in his Sermon on the Mount, uh, where it's not totally dis Continuous. It's certainly not discontinuous with the Old Testament, but it is regime change from the Old Covenant, where all those those harem holy war texts belong. They're they're not just isolated proof texts, timelessly universal truths. They they're part of a covenant that Hebrews says is obsolete. Well. Um, maybe I'll jump in, um, and I'd like to, maybe the couple of comments I'd like to make, but I'd like to pick up on the text of terror, because that is something that really did come up quite a bit in Norway. And I think one of the things that really struck me as I was looking at what can you kind of broadly be called divine violence, um, is that when God initiates, his work is always creative and redemptive. And the context for understanding God's violence then is only as a response to human sin or human evil. So whereas a lot of times the appropriation of a text of terror is to justify some situation that's perceived to be in line with God's agenda, I think what a lot of times people fail to realize is that violence in, from God's perspective is never gratuitous, 
it's always redemptive, it's always purposeful, it's always moving his people or other people in the direction of coming to know him better. So this one comment that really kind of struck me is that there's a fundamental difference, I think, between kind of human violence and divine violence. And I think there's a very, it's very precarious to be able to say that appropriation of human violence kind of as a modern holy war um, can be justified based on what God has done in the Old Testament. So I, I'm very sympathetic to what you just said about, you know, kind of this facile appropriation of the Old Testament and just saying, you know, we can just look at these texts and we can launch our own um, holy war. I do also really appreciate, and John probably can speak to this more, but just I think it's so important to understand the context of Haram, a holy war in the Old Testament, to understand that that is a one-time response in a very specific point in salvation history, um, that it also, if you look carefully, I think has redemptive purposes, um, both for uh, executing God's ju uh, judgment, but also having God's people see the real horrors of sin and the price that's involved in sin, and, and at some level realizing that they themselves will not be excluded from God's judgment if they walk the way of, of the others. So that's kind of one whole comment that I would just like to, to comment on. Um, Another comment, though, I'd just like to throw out is, so what do we do? And like you talked about with the regime change, and I think one of the things for me is that there's a lot of continuity and discontinuity, obviously. The discontinuity is that we're not living in a particular land in the same way that Israel was living in the land. But continuity would be that we're rooted in time and space. Uh, physicality is part of being human, and so the, to me the continuity is that our lives are to be the arena in which we live out our relationship with God such that those around us can see the living God. And to me that's analogous to God's intentions for having the people in the land, where the land was the arena in which they could live out their covenantal relationship for the benefit of the nations around. I, that, that placing Holy War in the context of redemptive history is, I, I agree, is so, so important. Um, I, I, I do think that we have a tendency to forget in our appropriation of these uh, texts that, they, that they, they really aren't texts of terror. They're texts of justice. As you were pointing out, it's God's justice. That it, that because his anger is aroused uh, by the offense that has been caused uh, and that he puts his own people, as you say, uh, uh, under the same penalties. Who would write a nationalistic history? We've all got these national myths of manifest destiny, every culture, uh, where you, you appeal to God or the gods for your land grabs. Who would write this history where the very people who are called to conquer this land in the very texts of their own constitution, their own history, describe it as something that they only reluctantly participated in and God gave them victory? <laughs> and then who would, who would add, we were placed under the sword just like the nation, so that if we pollute the land the same way they've polluted the land, it's not our land, it's God's land, we're tenants. Who, who does that? They never justified this idea of a, an unconditional, perpetual right to a geopolitical plot of land regardless of how they conduct themselves in it. It's God's land. And that's, that theocentrism separates, don't you think, separates these texts from all other texts of of holy war in national interests. This is not a nationalistic uh, enterprise. It becomes appropriated by yeah. so many nationalistic yeah. uh, motives, but it seems that the, the operative word there is Yahweh's purpose, and he keeps implementing that, and it's not, as we read so often in the biblical text, it's not about them and it's not about the land, it's about God's sovereign purpose in this situation. They are simply the instruments. And so I think it's fundamentally different to go out on a land grab from going out on a campaign that the Lord calls you to do and you vet it and you 
fail a few times because of your own sin and then he gets you sort of straightened out and sends you back again to implement his, his purposes. Um, again, Israel faces this consistent temptation to make it about themselves. But we look even, you know, in the Exodus narrative, Exodus 14, you know, I will glorify myself through attacking Egypt and the Pharaoh in the way I do. Or even in Ezekiel, how, how much more nationalistic at one level can you get than the restoration of a people group, than the return to the land? And yet, the Lord says, it's not about you. I'm going to glorify myself through this. And I have many instruments. And Israel, you are one instrument. Mm -hmm. So yes, be thankful that you are a particularly special instrument. But I think when we project f further forward to our own uh, Christian environment and our own uh, church environments, I think very often we are in the place of Israel in a sense of uh, pursuing the fool's gold of not just a nationalist perspective, but a we can do it by our own might, by our own strength, by our own abilities. And once again, I think we need to be brought back to Old and New Testament and say, okay, scripturally speaking, guided by the Holy Spirit, what is God calling us to do in this situation? Maybe it's just to be silent and allow you know, things to, to work out. Maybe it's to be very active, but in a contained way that is carefully vetting things through the lens of Scripture and through the leading of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit. Um, so holy war, I mean, that, that's, that's a large category. Um, I look at the broader question, and I so appreciate your writing and, uh, and your speaking because you are, you're anchored in a sound, consistent, exegetical method and you are able to make it applicable, applicable to contemporary issues. But you do so in a way that you're not abandoning that sound exegetical impulse. And then you're showing an awareness of church history and an awareness of these doctrines and not, as you say, just proof texting and making it into what we might call a, a collection of verses. So I really appreciate those aspects. And another thing is you invoke lots of non-evangelical scholarship, not for its own sake, but because a lot of it is really good. So I was a student of John Levinson, yeah. and uh, you know, anything he writes, yeah. I will read several times. <laughs> and maybe eventually I'll understand it, but <laughs> you know, it's just tremendous. And uh, you know, Eliada and very, very many other scholars you're invoking, and you're taking away what you describe in other contexts I've seen you describe, the insularity of the Reformed tradition or of the evangelical you know, orbit, and I appreciate that an awful lot. Along those lines, I, I suppose one of, the, one of the challenges here, I mean, we look at these events, like you've described, land, exile, exodus, conquest, pilgrimage, and we sort of have the impulse to either turn them into the veggie tales, kind of these, you know, otherworldly situations that contain some truth. And there, there's some benefit to that, to reduce them down to principles and make them applicable in our own, in our own context. That's right, exactly right. But the other side of it, um, it seems to me, um, those events are real events, and they have a reality outside of our own life experience and outside of, of any other person's life experience. And so it's not good enough to just condense the principles, because we can condense principles from Middle Earth and the you know, Lord of the Rings. There's a tremendous amount of truth there. But those events are not real, and they are not authoritative. The same thing with Narnia. I mean, you know, we cannot let Narnia displace the Eastern Mediterranean. The Eastern Mediterranean is the real venue, and it contains truth, but truth that is lived out. So I think there's something bigger going on here than extracting principles and living by them. And I guess that's one of my, my questions for you is how we allow for the tension of that real world not going away. There is still an Eastern Mediterranean. There is still a Palestinian church there. There is still a returned ethnic group of Israel there. There is still a cosmic space in Jerusalem. Um, even though Peter Walker and others would say, well, you know, and maybe yourself, I'm not sure, God's completely done with Jerusalem. What do we do with that, that lingering question, that lingering indicator throughout Scripture that physical Abraham physical Israel, physical exodus, physical conquest, physical apostasy, very real exile and return, apostolic spreading of the gospel. Those things are real and that actual work of God in real people is not finished yet. We have piggybacked into it. We've been grafted into it. 
but there's still a, a very real destination there. And I appreciate what you say, we can't go down the, the direction of just spiritualizing. Yeah. But what say you about the, the way it plays out from here out yeah. in the real world? Wow, uh, big, big issue. Uh, I think, first of all, um, we, we have sometimes uh, made a mistake of thinking of, of type and reality in terms of physical and spiritual, mm -hmm. cashing it out in a kind of platonic contrast that doesn't quite fit the biblical eschatology. And the, the, I, I go back to Genesis 15 and Genesis, Genesis 17 and uh, see there are two promises, uh, one promise being of a, a, a literal ethnic, see again, even literal, the church is literal, uh, hmm. a, an ethnic, a, a, let's just say geopolitical ethnic seed and a universal worldwide family. And those two promises are unconditional, but once Israel gets into the land, Sinai has, as it were, interrupted the course, the, the fulfillment of that second Abrahamic promise. They're both by grace, but the whole purpose of the Sinai geopolitical treaty is to be a, 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 a parenthesis, a type pointing forward to the reality. And that's why the, the holy wars uh, are wonderfully limited. If, you, if we have problems with Joshua's campaigns, then we really have problems with the book of Revelation. That's why a lot of people spiritualize, talk about spiritualizing, a lot of people spiritualize uh, the universal judgment that the New Testament talks about um, because it, it, it's just as salvation broadens in scope in the New Covenant, judgment does too. And we have problems with Jesus if we have problems with Joshua. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the ty so that you have these two covenants, but Sinai establishes the terms on which Israel will remain the geopolitical theocracy in God's land. And, you know, Hosea 6, 7, like Adam, Israel broke the covenant. Or I don't know how you interpret Adam there. Uh, and because of that now, Israel is exiled, but it's Christ who steps into those shoes, as it were, and it's really about Christ. Uh, it's not even so much that Israel points forward to the church, it points forward to Christ with his body. And uh, so once that's fulfilled, I won't be surprised hearing this from an millennials. once that's fulfilled, there is no geopolitical theocracy left, which is why Jesus says, you've heard it said, but I say, and, and uh, why the writer to the Hebrew says that it's, that old covenant is obsolete. Um, why Jeremiah prophesied that the new covenant will not be like that Sinai covenant with its conditionality and geopolitical circumscription to the land. Uh, so that's, that's how I would interpret those texts, although I do take the minority view in reform circles that uh, Ritter Boss and others argue that, that God still, based on Romans 9 through 11, God still has a plan for ethnic Jews uh, in the last days. When the fullness of the Gentiles is brought in, uh, there will be an outpouring of the Spirit among the Jewish people. Uh, yes, Paul says, even at this present time, I'm an example, but he also says, seems, seems to say, as the argument unfolds, there's going to be a more widespread blessing of which I am an example in the latter days. I'd like to just pick up on something you said too about kind of the the tendency that we have to spiritualize things. And for a different context, I've been thinking a lot about the Incarnation. And I've been thinking about that, you know, uh, to be f human is to be situated in a particular time and space by creation. I mean, that's how God created human beings. And so when you look at the Old Testament and you look at kind of the story of what God's doing, one of the things I think is hard for people to grasp is how particular it is. I mean, Abraham is one person at one point in time 
And you could say the same thing about Israel. You know, why Israel? Why not other nations? There's that particularity that, you know, sometimes people talk about the scandal of the particularity. But there's really a sense in which it's hard for us to grasp exactly how particular and finite that time and space, God's interaction with that is. But to me, that's the logic of the Incarnation, mm -hmm. where the Word becomes flesh. And if the Word's going to become flesh in a legitimate way to be a human being, that's going to be in time and space. Mm -hmm. And so it is, of course, in first century Palestine. So I think that's something that a lot of times today people don't take seriously. They don't understand that there is a, a physical rootedness that is just part of being human. And so one thing I think is helpful is we're kind of talking about your, your, your expression of ecclesial situatedness is that I don't think it is helpful to think about it necessarily in geopolitical terms, but if you take seriously in Acts, Luke makes a very deliberate parallel between the way the Spirit comes upon Jesus at his baptism as the beginning or the inauguration of his public ministry and the way the Spirit comes upon the assembled believers at Pentecost as kind of the inauguration of their public ministry. What that's always suggested to me is there's also an incarnational element there and that the Spirit does live within individual believers, but I think it's far more helpful to think about that the Spirit embodies and dwells within the body of Christ. So that changes the idea of our situatedness from kind of geopolitical terms to concrete physical terms. We're real, mm -hmm. um, otherwise the incarnation, I mean, if it all becomes spiritual, then I don't know how you can justify and understand this, the incarnation. Mm -hmm. Docetism becomes the only Oh, exactly, right. exactly. And, but yet, I would say that the many, many evangelical Christians today are living in very docetic or Gnostic terms, mm -hmm. where all of a sudden spiritual is good, physical is bad, and they don't have a category for understanding physical. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, to me, that's, if, if I kind of go back and look at the trajectory, I'm more inclined probably to go to the garden and look at how human beings were created than to only go, not only, it's very important to go to Abraham, but to to only go to a place where it becomes a little bit more couched in geopolitical terms. It seems regardless of circumstance, God is the primary agent and we are called to be vehicles. And so if we are conduits for his purposes, anchored in time and space in that way, um, we don't need constantly, yes, like David facing Goliath, we don't take one stone, we take five stones. Like Hezekiah, building a whole network of fortresses to stop the Assyrian assault. Yes, we take action as best we can, but ultimately we roll out the scroll as he did, and we say, Lord, your will be done. Game over. There's nothing else I can do. And if we have a game over attitude throughout our ministry and throughout God's acting work in our lives, it frees us up from uh, as some of the things you've illustrated here to implement you know, the kingdom now, to implement social justice now in our way, to make sure that, you know, as some of the Christian figures you've mentioned in some of your, um, some of your speaking uh, lately, to make it all about our action plan for the, for the current, you know, current world in which we live. And I think there's something very liberating about that. At a certain level, to show up and let God work, as he faithfully worked so many times. So you look at the New Testament and think of, you know, well, the Old Testament as well, but you, you think of, of Peter, well, shall I build a booth now? No, just rest. You know, let me help you out. No, I don't mean that right now. Let me cut the ear off of that, you know, that right. angry You're guy. You're not going to wash my feet. And juxtapose that exactly <laughs> with Jesus saying, you know, here's the, the maker of it all. Into your hands I commend my spirit. If it, if it be thy will, let it pass, but, you know, thy will be done. And would that we would show up and be available as he was in his ministry in every situation responding to God's purposes and kingdom building rather than some sort of personal agenda, comfort, whatever it may be. Absolutely, and this, this is exactly why I think, though we don't, shouldn't uh, you know, do everything that they did, Reformation spirituality is, is so helpful here. And I, it, I think uh, it, one, one thing that I hope for in the future is that there isn't a jump from this kind of docetic mm -hmm. spirituality to the more embodied spiritualities of, of frankly, traditions that, that don't, whose spirituality doesn't arise out of the core gospel uh, sufficiently. And that is uh, a, a piety that says, 
look, I am a citizen of two kingdoms. And in the kingdom of Christ, I am a recipient. <laughs> All of, uh, I, I am receiving gifts from God. All good gifts come down from God. I'm never the giver in this relationship. I'm the rece recipient. Well, then where do our good works go? As Luther said, God doesn't need your good works, your neighbor does. <laughs> enormous activity, and history reports enormous activity. Now people were freed up to love and serve their neighbors in their vocations, driven by the gospel out into the world. It didn't cre create this quietism because the world is, yeah, it's a dangerous place. The church is a dangerous place. Uh, it's, we're a dangerous place. <laughs> That's why both of them are dangerous places. But yet, God loves and cares for the world in his common grace, just as he cares for and loves his body in his saving grace. And so we, while we distinguish those two kingdoms, at the life of the individual believer, they intersect. And so the, the tightrope, I, I think, to walk here is how we how we stop thinking we can bring in the kingdom of Christ by our good works, and at the same time are involved where God has called us out in the world to love and serve our neighbors. Not detached from that, but driven by that. Confusing those two things, I think, is one of the great challenges, or separating them so that they have no connection at all, is one of the greatest challenges in our day.